We're very excited that we get to introduce these incredible people. They're, uh, they are literally inventing the new internet. They're creating the future. Uh, they're funding it. They're building it. And I'm very, very excited to introduce, remember the wave part. You ready? Michael Ash and James Thornton. Let's hear it. Look at that. Look at that. Whoa, That's wow. for you. Pretty <laughs> impressive. Job, sir. Thank you, sir. We're, we're not going to be even. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Jonathan Burke. Uh, <laughs> appreciate that intro. Um, I'm James Thornton, CEO of Taffy. Uh, really excited to be here um, and to participate in this event. And I'm particularly excited to sit alongside my good friend. And while, as you can probably tell, my junior, uh, much younger than I am, uh, but still yet a, a business mentor. See, they're talking about us over here. Then we'll talk louder. Yeah, so um, really glad uh, to, to be here, uh, even in this fun and entertaining format. So um, I'm going to ask Michael to take just a minute, uh, introduce himself a little bit, and to introduce uh, the firm that he's a part of, Galaxy Digital. So take it away, Michael. Yeah, uh, happy to be here. Really excited to be part of this session. Um, for, for those who don't know, Galaxy is a crypto-focused merchant bank. And so what that means is, not only do we invest principally in cryptocurrencies, but we work directly with companies and investors in this space to help really further the adoption. And so when you think about Galaxy, you know, everything from sales and trading to asset management to um, investment banking, Bitcoin mining, and, and where I sit and, and lead is really the advisory business, which is nothing more than a fancy way of saying investment banking. Awesome. Um, so, you know, let's get to kind of the, the early stage part of, of Web3. Let's talk for a second about crypto yep. and talk about the NFT market. Um, and let's start with a, a question I think probably most of these folks have. Um, what's the state of the union like, Michael? I mean, how, how do you see the, the market today from a, from a macro perspective? Yeah, it's an incredibly, uh, I'll use the word dynamic, uh, time in the markets for crypto and, and really more broadly. Um, you know, I, there, a term we often hear in crypto is this concept of, of the winter, right? Which is really another crypto term for a bear market. And we've seen several of them in the past and what we're in right now is another bear market. But what's unique about this bear market is that it's coinciding with a, a much broader macro dislocation. And that's something we've never seen before in this space. Um, and interestingly, you know, when you think about crypto as an asset class, we are today much more correlated to the broader equity markets than we've ever been correlated in the past. And so there's no question that, you know, whether it was Celsius or BlockFi or Luna, there have been all of these uh, unfortunate events that have certainly contributed to the overall market decline, but I think really right now what we're dealing with is is a, a macro backdrop that's really tough for everyone. So um, may, maybe we could ask kind of a, a show of hands out there. How many of you hold crypto or NFTs? How many of you actually have both? I'm I'm curious. Okay, a lot of these folks here in front wearing taffy shirts. That's great. Um, so. Do we hold, Michael? I mean, what's the future? What, what, what do you think? Look, Should we be investors and hold on to the assets we have? Well, I'm not allowed to answer that question expressly. <laughs> um, I, look, I think for us, when we think about where we are today, what's so interesting and unique is that for the first time maybe ever in crypto's existence, you're seeing institutions like BlackRock and, and you know, these even Warner this morning with OpenSea, you're seeing these very significant financial institutions, large corporates and industry that are, that are moving into the space. And, you know, additionally, there is now billions of dollars of capital that is, that is earmarked to be deployed into the space to help companies grow, right? And that's something that's never been the case in other bear markets. And so personally, yes, I'm holding. That's awesome. But, yeah. I, I like the way you, you spun that to, to say personally you're holding. That's great. I've, I've spent enough time with our legal team. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Awesome. Well, let's, let's pivot for a second and maybe take more of a, a 50,000 yeah. foot view. Um, let's talk Web3. Um, I'm guessing most of the folks here in this session are pros 
and understand uh, Web3 and the future of Web3, but from a person, uh, from your perspective and, and where you sit, why don't you describe a little bit your thoughts around what is Web3 and yeah. how does it differ from Web2? Yeah, well, it's a Web3 is the next version of Web2, right? And what it really is very simply, if you think of the internet as Web2, right? And the internet as we know it, when we go home, when we go on our phones or on our, our laptops, desktops, like that's Web2, very simply. Web3 is the next iteration of that. And, and the, the implementation of, it's really math, right? That allows for decentralization. And that's really, when you get into Web3, the word you'll, that you're here, you will hear more and more is decentralized. Um, and the, the idea being very simply to take out the intermediaries, which have historically played some role in helping to govern, right? Companies and markets. Um, and it, all of it is, the decentralization is achieved by using this concept of the blockchain, right? Which is, an, again, it's incredibly complicated um, math-based software, effectively, to help govern. But you should please chime in. Well, uh, well, we'll come back to that and dive a little deeper into Web3. Um, let me ask you, and uh, uh, to also define then your thoughts around what is the metaverse? I mean, yeah. such a popular buzz thing to say, describe metaverse. The metaverse, and this, these are not my words, I'm, I'm not that smart. I, I think the, the most eloquent definition of the metaverse that I've heard is really a, an immersive virtualized internet, right? And so again, it's, it's moving from your phones and thinking about interacting with the internet in a fundamentally different way in an immersive you know, environment that allows you to connect to other people in real time, connect to places in real time, connect to companies in real time, um, but needless to say, James, you, you're sitting at the center of it, so <laughs> you, you have to have an answer here as well. Sure. So, so let's uh, let's maybe go back to, to Web three a little bit and and discuss that. Um, and again, I'll I'll talk more kind of broadly about uh, my view, and then you know maybe we can dive a little deeper into some concepts like NFTs and and what that that really means. Um, from my perspective, um, Web3, as you already described, is about decentralizing um, ownership. It's about, um, in, from our perspective, uh, user-generated content. Um, you know, a great example, um, a few months ago, a, a colleague of mine and I were sitting with one of the top entertainment executives in, in the world, huge studio, huge titles, huge brands, and they, they were struggling and are struggling with trying to figure out what they want to do in this Web3 user-generated content space. And uh, so pretty much they've done nothing. Um, just kind of waiting to let other people be on the bleeding edge and then deciding if, if they were going to jump in. And what happened, um, and you guys will, will all remember this, um, is it, it was right in the middle of the trial uh, with Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. And what shook this studio's leadership was the fact that the, the actual number of people who were tuning in to the trial, and then more importantly, the content that was created by those users that were tu tu tuning into the trial, during that period of time, there was more viewership of Johnny Depp and Amber Heard and the content created around that than the top 20 titles on Netflix. Um, combined. And to me, that is a great uh, example of what is Web3. It's, it's generated content, it's ownership to the individual, it's how we represent ourselves digitally or virtually, which um, we already know statistically we spend more time interacting with people virtually than we, we do uh, in person. And that's only going to continue. Yeah. So, for me, that's, that's Web3. The, the definition of metaverse is there's just a whole bunch of them, right? The, me, the metaverse is, uh, a metaverse is a place where we go and play and interact and engage with things we, we love to do. There's not one definition or one example of the metaverse, uh, but there's a lot of really fun examples of what a metaverse is and how we interact. So. I think you made a really good point there a minute ago, which was that in many ways we're already engaging 
with this technology in our everyday lives. Right? And as you think about the, the further implementation of it, it's going to feel more and more intuitive. Right? And I think part of the struggle today for people who are just starting to get into this space is that you know, it can be very complicated. Right? The interface, the UI, it's just, it doesn't have the intuitive feel that we're all accustomed to in how we use and interact with the internet today. But that's changing, right? And that's, that's frankly part of the role that you guys play. Yeah. You know, Michael, you interact with uh, the largest tech companies in the world, the largest Web2 companies in the world, today's internet. Um, help us understand, number one, as, as you're seeing, like the example I gave of this big entertainment studio, as you're seeing Web2 companies wake up to, to Web3, what, what, what you're seeing are, are some of those what reasons or some of the activities that they're engaging in. And then maybe add to that why you think they have to do that. Like this isn't yeah. this isn't a choice. Web three's here. Um, they don't have a choice. And why is that the case? It's a really interesting question. And the answer is, I think, really simple, which is that the metaverse and this Web three concept is really just an evolution from the internet, right? And so it's think of it very simply as the next version of the internet. The only difference is that you're going to interact with it in a very different way. And so maybe the easiest way to think about it from a metaverse perspective is think about e-commerce, right? And you know, historically, you'd go to a store, you'd buy something in a store, then all of a sudden Amazon popped up and now you buy every single thing in your home from Amazon and it's there 24 hours later. Um, but you know, the, the ability to actually go and interact and see things up close in the metaverse is the reason why companies like Walmart, being a good example, are pouring significant amount of resources and capital into making sure that they have a Web3 strategy and they have a metaverse strategy, right? Because it's really, again, just an evolution of what they've done well historically, but utilizing a new way to connect to your audience and connect to your customers. That's really interesting. I mean, Walmart specifically, as an example, is interesting given, you know, obviously their, their history in brick and mortar. A um, couple of years ago, kind of waking up and realizing they needed a strong, yeah. you know, online presence. Uh, to hear you saying they're, they're pumping, you know, billions of dollars into that strategy is, is really unique. You expect that from the game segment. You expect yep. that from entertainment. You expect that from other areas. But from e-commerce, that, that, that's really interesting to me. Well, I think that's the interesting point that you made earlier, which is that the metaverse is going to take many different shapes, right? And it's going to be different depending on the industry and the company and the use case that someone is trying to implore. Mm -hmm. Wow, really interesting. Um, let, let, let's talk for a second specifically about the use case for NFTs. Yeah. Um, I know you're going to flip the I'm definitely going to flip whatever you're about to on, ask. On this one. But, uh, but, but describe, I mean, obviously you've seen this, this incredible, uh, over the last couple of years, I mean, what we call the OGs of the uh, non-fungible token space are yep. companies that have been um, around for, you know, if you're lucky, a couple of years, um, in, a, in a lot of cases, just months, um, you know, and, and here in Utah, uh, we like to think that we know a little bit about uh, and NFTs and have some leadership here. You know, shout out to our friends from Artifact who were purchased from Nike. I mean, they hail from here. Uh, and you guys will love that session, by the way, at 4 o'clock. Um, but, but talk about that space specifically and, and, and what you see is kind of the, the rise and then what the steady state future looks like. And then I'll probably chime in there. You know, you were, you were right. I'm definitely going to punt it back to you. Okay. Yeah, well, I... That's a lousy question when it's, you know, I'm asking myself that question. But, um, so, it, you know, it, it sounds cliche, but um, you hear people say that NFTs will have arrived as an important part of Web3, an important part of our day-to-day -day lives when we stop talking about them as NFTs. Um, in, in, you know, in big buckets, uh, uh, non-fungible tokens um, represent everything from unique ownership uh, to uh, the way we, you know, engage entertainment, interoperability. Um, it's the way big brands engage uh, their consumers more and more today. Uh, you know, even the VIP um, group here, uh, there's, a, there's an NFT pass 
um, for VIPs um, to be part of, of Silicon Slopes. And again, I think you're going you're gonna to see that access, ownership, interoperability, uh, a passport that takes you across the internet where you can represent yourselves uh, in all sorts of different platforms. Um, I think that's, uh, th that's what, what we're seeing more and more for NFTs. It, it's, it's less about that collectability and the big $100,000 um, you know, PFPs mm -hmm. and, and more about uh, true ownership and what that represents. So, so where do you think we are in that evolution? Uh, well, you, you know, again, I, I think it really depends on, on which area that, that you're talking about. I think in terms of like proprietary collections that companies are launching, that's one thing we do at, at Taffy is launch, um, you know, our own IP, our own proprietary collections. And we still have some cool stuff coming up, but, but the area where we really see um, things booming are in areas like entertainment and fan engagement. So uh, from the gaming space to the entertainment space, we're working with companies um, across fashion and automotive and all sorts of areas um, where people are using NFTs to engage their customer base and, their, and engage their fan base. How much time do you think from you know, a marketing and engagement perspective, are those brands spending on, you know, NFT properties and Web3 broadly? Uh, you know, I think generally speaking for large Web2 tech, uh, it's, it's still a small percentage, but it's, it's getting more, you know, it's, it's increasing yeah. um, more and more. And, and what I think you'll see is you'll see this intersect between Web2 and Web3 where um, you know the big Web3 brands, like an artifact, and now part of Nike, will be using those Web2 companies or helping those Web2 companies really be the, the entree into Web3 right. and into a, a metaverse strategy. So that's, that's going to continue to increase. And we're, we're seeing more and more of that, where kind of proprietary collection launches are fewer today than they were a year ago or two years ago. Um, the, the brand engagement uh, is increasing, no question. I was going to ask you um, if you had uh, like a thought um, around a, you know, a company that um, is kind of demonstrating that balance between the Web 2 and Web 3 intersect, maybe, maybe a, a, a company that you could, could point to that, that is doing that well. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked the question because I did put together a short reel. Could we, uh, could we roll that? Sure. Technology at its best. So what did we just see? What the hell was that? Yeah, so it, it would be, I, I, I'm embarrassed to act like I didn't know you were, you were going to run that reel. It is a, it is a shameless plug. Uh, and that was actually not the video no, it that wasn't. I, I thought uh, we, we were going to show. Um, wh what that does, I, I, I mean, what we do um, is it, it, we provide the tools and technology for individuals and companies to engage in creating virtual identity. Yeah. And, and that's what, what you really see there is uh, actually years of, of hard work creating technology that allows an individual user uh, to, to be able to engage with our tech. Now, if it was the video that I, I was planning for you to show, uh, it, it, it would show some of that brand engagement um, that we talked about and you would see um, you know, companies like Warner Brothers and, and others that are putting a lot of money and, and time behind this effort. 
how, how much do they understand about what goes into this and how much of it is an education when you're out and you're like talking to these web two brands? Because I know in my day to day, you know, I would say 90% of my day is spent talking to builders in web three, right? Who are speaking a completely different language than the one we're speaking here today. But <laughs> the, the conversation when you're talking to a Warner Brothers or, or you know, whomever it may be, I would imagine is wildly different. Yeah, I mean, I think it. I, I think it really depends on on the company. I mean, obviously, there are are brands out there um, that technology is part of their core competency, and that's a different discussion than than again if if the core competency is creating entertainment. Um, and so the, those conversations vary. Um, but a, a, again, I, I am I am very surprised, consistently surprised at how. Um, how much education still yeah. needs to happen at even the most senior levels at, uh, at the, the best tech companies in the world. We, we see that um, from investors, for what it's worth, right? When we're out raising for a company, you know, whatever it may be, and you go out today, everyone, you know, whether you're early stage, mid stage, late stage, as an investor, you have to have some portion of your fund allocated towards crypto. You, you don't have to, but you probably should. Um, and, and I think part of the challenge for someone who is maybe deploying capital for the first time into the space is that this is a fundamentally very different technology. The use case is at times very different. Like I mentioned before, you know, often the, the UI is not intuitive or something that they've interacted with in the past. And so we spend a, a very significant amount of our time on capital raises in particular, helping to educate investors so that they can start to understand the, the value and what's unique about the companies that we work with. Which is why you have the skills to put a video like that together. Correct. Because you spend so much time doing it. Um, you know, you, you raise a, a really interesting question. You know, one of the things that um, I think we're very proud of here in Utah is, is there definitely is this, this is a, a place for entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and uh, a real entrepreneurial spirit. And particularly on the tech side, I think there's been incredible advances over the, the past several years, including um, companies that are targeting um, the Web3 space. Um, maybe just take a couple minutes and, and share your thoughts on the, the markets out there, yeah. um, the, the availability to capital, and how would uh, a founder um, or a founding team uh, approach a, a fundraising effort? Yeah. I mean, so we've talked a bit about the, the broad dislocation in the market. and. What's really interesting in, is that that dislocation, for whatever reason, hasn't seemed to make its way to, to very early stage companies and founders. So if you're raising as a pre-seed or a seed round, there is still not only a lot of capital, and, and by a lot, there's literally billions of dollars waiting to be deployed, but it, it's capital that is available at very attractive valuations. A lot of the valuations that we saw last year across the board in this space, early stage, late stage, what have you, were very inflated. That's gone away for the late stage and mid stage, but it's really, for the most part, stayed for very early stage founders. And so arguably, you know, this is a very unique time to be a founder and to try to stand up a business. Um, look, the, the, the only advice I can give in terms of raising capital as a very early stage founder is figure out what investors you want to be talking to and hound that person until they take your call. Right? I think part of what those investors look for is someone that has the tenacity and the grit to get their attention. Right? Um, and, and ultimately, yeah, I think for the first couple raises, oftentimes that's in some ways part of the bar for an investor to even pay attention. Mm -hmm. No, really interesting. Um, so so we've, got a, we've got a few minutes left. Um, you know, I, let's uh, just a, a, a couple of other kind of rapid fire questions yeah. for you. Um, one, one question that I think is on everyone's mind is, and, and I kind of know how you're going to answer this already, but on regulation and, yeah. and what that means. I mean, when we're talking about Web3 being decentralized by nature, uh, that includes crypto and, and NFTs. Um, what are your thoughts on, on kind of regulatory things coming down the pipe? I can say with absolute certainty that as a, as a whole, the industry, I, I think, is in favor of regulation and excited for there to be some level of transparency 
in terms of what that regulation is going to look like. The problem is that we don't know what it's going to look like. We don't know who is going to regulate. We don't know how they're going to regulate. And to your point, one of the really interesting and strange things about the space is that it's borderless. Right? And so you have different regulatory regimes in different jurisdictions. And so how do you think about operating here versus there when in theory, because everything is decentralized, th there, is no, there is no central hub. And so there's going to be a lot of work that needs to happen in the very near term, over the midterm, long term, to figure this out. But um, hopefully sooner than later. Awesome. OK, well, um, we hadn't planned on this. But uh, I see we've got maybe 15 minutes left. Um, maybe we could uh, gather a question or two sure. from, from the crowd. Anybody have a question they want to ask Mr. Ash? Not me. Not me. Well, let me ask you a question. Cause is there a hand? Go, go ahead. You, you, you ask your question, and then we'll, well, no, don't start we'll, with we'll me. go up here. OK. Yeah. Um, you know, from, from your seat, you know, what do you think, like, how would you suggest someone start in this space? What do you think, like, attribute-wise, does someone need to bring both personally, professionally, and from a company to, to be successful in a market like this? Uh, are, are you talking about just kind of general market conditions or specific to Web3? I would, I would say Web3. Yeah, so... Um, I, I think there's no shortage of ideas and concepts that, that people want to engage in. I think, um, I, I, I think the first step is uh, to just be, be passionate about your idea, right? And um, find, there, I think there are still so many areas potentially of, of Web3 that remain unexplored. So uh, we're, we're going to have a session tomorrow, for example, um, on FinTech and, and DeFi. Um, a, a great area, that's an area that I think is probably more mature. Um, uh, uh, other areas, um, like in our business, um, where, where you're focused on, on technology around virtual identity, I think that's a little bit more, more difficult. Yeah. And finding whatever that niche is that, that helps in, in, in those areas, I, I think, is a big, a big part of that. Can you talk more about virtual identity and why you think it's important? I think that's something that's incredibly interesting happening. And I, I don't think a lot of people talk enough about it. Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I would define virtual identity as how we represent ourselves digitally and how we, we communicate and interact with other people online. As I mentioned earlier, I think we do more of that than we, we do actually socializing and interacting with people in person. And so uh, what makes that really special is... You, there are no boundaries, right, in how I want to identify myself um, virtually. I mean, if I want to be a, if, if I want to be across different platforms and metaverses, if I want to be a little black rain cloud, I can. Yeah. If I want to be a centaur, I can. I, I, the way I represent myself can be truer to the identity I feel about myself than than even the way I represent myself in the myself in the real world. And again, that's going to become increasingly more important. So as part of that, there has to be that interoperability. There has to be the ability to represent myself in social media platforms the way I would in gaming platforms, the way I would on a Zoom call, yep. um, just about any area of, of the way I, I, I want to represent myself virtually. I want to have that identity yep. that kind of is my passport across different metaverses. When did you first discover Web3? Well, um, I mean, uh, if, if you're talking about our company 20 years ago, um, okay. uh, and, and, and I would say, you, you know, more the concept around metaverse, but this concept around identity, yeah. this is what our, our business has been doing for a couple of decades. Um, for, for us, you know, for me personally, it's been drinking from a fire hose the last few years, just like everybody yeah. else. And um, so, so I would say it's, it's been really the last three or four years that that, that has become such a prominent thing. Yeah. I yeah think we, we had a question up here. Yeah, go ahead. Somebody might have to relay that question. I can't hear anything. I'm sure it's a really good question, but we can't hear a thing. <laughs> yeah. 
How, how about this? I think this guy has a question here. Maybe make your way down a little further for, for us. Let's start right here. It's a really good question. Yeah, yeah so, so the question I'll for ask any question, go ahead. Yeah, the, the question for those who couldn't hear is how important is it for the communities that, that are building and a part of crypto effectively, like to have some something physical and tangible to hold on to? And I'll, I'm going to defer to you, but I think you should take a first cut at this. Yeah, when, when I spoke earlier that, that NFTs will have arrived when we start talking about NFTs, that really is a function of that, the, the digital coming together with, with the physical, whether it's the way we connect to each other um, or it's product. Uh, you know, I think you're seeing more and more, and Artifact is a great example, Chris may talk about this later, um, of, of how there, there is this digital component of where there's a, a physical product associated with your NFT um, or with your digital identity. And I think you'll see that more and more. Again, NFTs are going to become the passes, the tickets, uh, all of those things that, that bring us to physical events like this and sporting events and ski passes and everything else. Those are, those are all going to be ownership that is, is recorded on the blockchain, in my opinion. But even if there isn't utility in that way, like think of how we met, right? Oh, yeah. We met you because someone on our team was at a party at South by Southwest for the Doodles, yeah. which is a very popular um, NFT. And you had to be a Doodle NFT holder to actually be there, right? And so I, I think a lot of the most successful, even today, like the PFPs, like some of the most successful communities are already working together and banding together and coming together physically to sort of share their passion for, you know, what they're doing together. And so I, I do think it's really important. And I think it's even tangible today, even when there isn't, you know, an explicit utility like, like you referred to. Right. And, and, and brands are going to want to engage in that. So this bringing together that personal ownership and the brand activations that I talked about, um, will we, I, I think we have a promotional video going out today on, for October 5th. We're launching a new collection called Fight Back Apes. And as part of that, we're partnering with Atari uh, to be part of that. So now Atari's able uh, to engage with this entire community of, of Fight Back Apes that, that we've been building and will build through our NFT release. Okay, you made the track, man. Let's hear it. I can hear him. Keep going. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Okay, so there are two questions. The, the first question is following, you know, the crash and, and what we've seen happen to a number of, you know, thousands of people from the, the Luna crash in particular, there's been a whole, you know, mass number of people who effectively had, you know, th their savings wiped out, right? Um, and who are unlikely to participate in crypto going forward. Um, and so I guess the question was like, what, what can we do as a community to bring those people back, right? Um, you know, it's interesting. I was at um, an event hosted by uh, a consulting firm earlier this week. And one of the data points that they showed was 
uh, if you, uh, I believe at the, as of basically pre-Luna, right, the number, the percentage of people in the U.S. who were interested or already deploying capital into crypto versus that same percentage today. And interestingly, that number hasn't changed, right, which was surprising to me because to your point, we've seen so many people, you know, unfortunately harmed by, by Luna and by some of these other things that are outstanding. Um, and so look, unfortunately, I, I think when you looked at what happened with Luna and in the market more broadly, you have retail investors who probably, you know, are less focused on risk management. You know, they probably deployed too much of their own liquid net worth into what is an incredibly volatile asset class, right? Um, and it's going to take years for that volatility to go away, right? And so part of it, I think, is the maturation more generally, right? Understanding that you're not supposed to put all of your liquid net worth into crypto. It's only supposed to be a percentage, and we can argue about that percentage. But um, it's definitely not supposed to be the entirety. And so I think a lot of it is patience. Look, we continue to see large institutions like BlackRock and others who are actively coming into the space. Like the BlackRock Coinbase deal is very, very significant, right? It means that BlackRock, the world's largest asset manager, is going to bring you know, their clients into the space in a way that they haven't historically had access to it. You know, these announcements, they continue to come. And so I think for me, when I, you know, again, this is, I think you have to view it as a long game. I think any idea or notion that things are going to turn around very quickly, we should sort of ignore, right? And if you really believe in this and you fundamentally understand what we're trying to build for, there's going to be volatility up, there's going to be volatility down. And part of it is having the conviction and, and I think a set of principles which help guide you in this space. But there's no question there was harm done and it's incredibly unfortunate and we're all trying to, you know, recover from it. The second question, um, was about centralization, right? When you have companies like Binance and FTX and others who are fundamentally centralized businesses, how should we think about a centralized company operating in a world who effectively touts decentralization as a core principle? Um, and the way I think about it is, is on a spectrum, right? You've got centralization on one side and you've got decentralization on another. Um, I don't know necessarily what like what the right answer is on that spectrum. But in my view, there's always going to be some sense and some semblance of centralization in this space, right? It's logical to me now that you have exchanges that are centralized. Obviously, there's a whole number of large DEXs that are becoming increasingly more used by retail and institutions alike. Um, and so it's going to be an evolution. And I think part of what the industry has to do is figure out what that right balance is. But I'd be lying if I told you today I, I, I knew what that was. But I think you will, you, you will still see centralization. And frankly, a lot of the infrastructure companies that are building, whether it's on the regulatory side, whether it's on the tax side, whether it's on um, even like staking, they're, they're centralized, right? And, and part of that is because it's really hard to manage the operations and build the tech and actually you know, have the software stack and the regulatory and license stack that you need if you're going to be fully decentralized. And so it's a really good question, um, but it's, it's, it's one that's really complicated. And ultimately, I think it's a question of where it sits on that, that spectrum. I don't know if you want to add to it. No, no, that was great. Did I lose my mic? No. Okay. No, that was great. Good job. Maybe one more question. Go ahead. So uh, I wanted to know uh, what you guys thought about uh, proof of stake versus proof of work for blockchains. And um, also, uh, how are you going to be adapting NFTs for general use when uh, you're looking at you know, an ether or a tenth of an ether um, instead of you know, using a blockchain where your, your uh, cost of transaction is a lot lower. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll start with kind of the second part of, of your question. Um, you know, I, I think general access will, first of all, with, with the merge, we've obviously seen some decrease in those transaction costs. I think that will continue to happen. 
But I think general use, and we even debated that with Silicon Slopes around the, the pass here. When we offered the, the NFT as part of the, the VIP pass here, uh, we did that as, as crypto. And we had a very small percentage of people that had ETH wallets set up and, and were able to, to do that. So we transitioned um, to, uh, to allow people to use credit cards. So I think, uh, I think you know, mass adopt, not mass adoption, but larger adoption of, of NFTs will come when there's the flexibility uh, to pay not just in crypto, but in fiat as well. Your, your first question is a really complicated question, which people, even at Galaxy, argue about day in and day out, right? Um, you know, it's interesting. The, the, a lot of the, I think, public sentiment around proof of work versus proof of stake has really circled around this idea of energy consumption and energy usage. Right, and, and what, what impact does proof of work have on our grid and more generally have as we think about carbon emissions, right? Um, you know, to some degree, well, one, I think it's a very fair argument and one which we should absolutely be talking about. On the other hand, I, I, I don't think it is n nearly as significant of an issue as some people like to think it is. I mean, a lot of studies that we've seen uh, indicate that, that roughly 70% of proof of work miners actually take their energy from renewable energy resources, right? And so, you know, look, Bitcoin, I, I think, holds the place that it does in part, you know, not only because it's proof of work, but more generally, you know, the, the consensus mechanism is, is incredibly strong and is proven to, frankly, uh, withstand the test of time in a way that nothing else has other than ETH, which came later, obviously. Um, but then you have Ethereum, who just, as, as James alluded to, just recently moved from proof of work to proof of stake. Um, a lot of that, I, I think, one, they, they believe, to your point, that it'll be more efficient from a gas perspective. Um, they believe that it'll be more efficient from an energy con consumption perspective. I think the majority of the new projects that we're seeing do utilize proof of stake. There, there's, you know, that's, that's sort of obvious. Um, but again, it's a very, very highly debated topic. And as you know, like the Bitcoin maxis feel very strongly. And then you have, you know, ETH and others who today feel very strongly about proof of stake. I don't think there's a world where we're going to have one consensus mechanism, right? And we frankly don't know what's next, right? I think the beauty of what we're seeing in this space is that things change and, and grow so quickly. Like there will be something else that comes that we're not thinking about today. Awesome. Well, Michael. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I, I think that's it. Really great uh, to, to have you here and spend time with you. And thank you all for being here. Thanks, guys.